I am very happy to be helping with this conversation, which is happening right at the Lagrange point between poetry and science, one of my favorite places to be. And we are so glad to welcome our very special guest, Deva Sobel, a longtime science writer for impressive publications like the New York Times and Discover Magazine, but also the uh, author of seven books and a play that all of them illuminate the people of science, including one particular book called Galileo's Daughter, which brings me to the other participant in today's conversation, Paul Pearson, um, whose brand new collection of poetry, Lunatic Engine, was inspired by Galileo's Daughter and is a kind of dialogue with that book. So today, we're going to take that conversation a bit further with both of you. Um, okay, so Paul, since, since it is your, your book that we're celebrating here, I'm going to ask you to start off with reading a particular poem um, in the very face of the sun. So will you do that for us right now? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, uh, it is uh, it is a pleasure um, to uh, to be with you and with uh, with Deva today, one of uh, one of my literary heroes. So, um, in the very face of the sun, the first draft of this was an imagined account of the teenager next door's death by driving too fast down the dump road, the late afternoon sun flashing on the nearly still beaver dammed creek just off the shoulder, a sharp turn taken over undercut gravel crumbling and the old truck is on its side. Water pouring into the cab from below, sun pouring in from above. The second draft of this was all about the science, the immutability of the heavens, the immobility of the earth, Galileo and the Nova of 1604, the true word of God and authority even higher than the Bible. Copernicus pulled the pin on the heliocentric grenade, then promptly died before it could go off. Galileo picked it up, tested its weight through math and motion, even before his telescope and his satellites holding that grenade in the very face of the sun and its spots, its clouds, its vapors attracted from the ether. When you get to the end of all of this, you'll look back and know this is the point. The quality of miracles isn't what it used to be caught between the metonymy of dump roads and grenades and the memory of your first childhood encounter with death. You're sitting suspended, immobilized, the mutable sun blinding you as the immutable waters rise. Thank you, Paul. And this is a poem that really braids together the personal history of the poet and the ideas from science. And so this is where I'd kind of like to ask Deva, your books are so much about people and the people of science. And I, I want you to, could you talk a little bit about why that would be important for us? Yes, because people do science. Science is a creative endeavor and it's very much uh, a part of these people's lives, who they are affects how they do science. Mm -hmm. And that has always really interested me. From how, how old were you when you started engaging with the people aspect of science? I think early on, I remember learning about Galileo in school uh -huh. and learning things about him that turned out not to be true, <laughs> uh, which was part of why I was drawn to this story, why the, the existence of his daughter so captivated me. But I may be, um, I may be jumping ahead of the conversation. <laughs> no, this, this is not necessarily a straight line conversation. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, so, but perhaps we'll... Scientists are, are people who notice things yes. and think about them. And, and poets are like that too. Exactly. Um, so, 
Galileo was exploring the notion of change in unalterable, in heavens that were thought to be unalterable. Is that a pretty fair summary of, of his position in the science? He, that he, he noticed change where change was not supposed to take place. Uh -huh. And that was one of the ways he got into so much trouble. <laughs> And that takes us back to your, your um, poem, Paul. Do you want to talk about for you how that issue of change versus no change, the immutable kind of worked into the poem? Um, yeah, the ability to change one's mind is, you know, of course, at the very heart of what science is, but I, I think it's also really what it means to be human um, in in uh, in this in this world. Uh, it, sadly, it's also something that seems to be uh, absent from a lot of, of public discourse these these days. The ability to to look at the situation, take in new information, and and uh, um, change one's mind according to that that information. So that ability and and that that bravery, the courage to do that is one of the things I admire most about Galileo, um, the way he uh, looked at those immutable truths at, at the time um, through uh, just observing physical phenomena, um, asking those questions, uh, willing to change how he thought, and to teach others to do the same as, as well. Galileo did, uh, did a lot of, of, of teaching through his, through his life. Um, and it's important to remember that for Galileo, this wasn't a simple act without without consequence, as as Deva uh, hinted. Um, this did get him in, in a lot of trouble, and and the Inquisition was was a deadly serious uh, business. Changing his mind could have cost him everything, up to and in, including his his life. There's actually a poem later in the in the book that uh, that looks that issue squarely at uh, squarely in the in the face. But it's that you know the, the question is sticking to the immutable preferable to to changing um those are the stakes that the images in this in this poem really are, are playing with you know as the immutable waters rise where are you going to turn your eyes all right well maybe uh we should read that poem about uh that, that in a way you referred to um it's about the Black Plague, <laughs> and that seems rather appropriate for the middle of a pandemic. Um, <laughs> would you like to, to read the next one for us? Sure. Um, this one is called, Since the Lord Chastises Us With These Whips. How many times did he open the door, checking to see if death was sneaking up on him? I often think of Galileo this way, the plague bubbling up from the flagstones, panic and fear burning through the city, a flea under his microscope, fangs bared, but not talking, not giving up the genetic map. To be so close to the truth, a Frenchman would finally identify the plague bacteria more than 250 years later. To know how to get the answer, but to have no time, there's never enough time. And all around, everyone else puts their faith in alchemy and magic, and all around flowers, folk medicine. I'm telling you now, death stalks us differently. No more buboes or black skin sloughing off. Dead rats don't drift against the door anymore. Everything is dying quietly, and there are too many things to believe in. Too many choices for salvation. And the flea still bears its fangs under the microscope, and I keep opening the door. Don't we all, <laughs> looking out at the world, and what's coming at us. Um, I'm interested, Paul, it, like, uh, give us a little bit more background on, on the, the, on Galileo's situation during the plague there. Um, so, you know, the plague regularly uh, passed through um, uh, cities and towns uh, throughout Europe, and so it wasn't an uncommon thing for people to be spending a lot of time alone um, at home uh, trying to, to, you know, stay alive, uh, as it were. And Galileo did a lot of his, his work during um, some of his best thinking and, and writing during, uh, during plague times. Um, 
And, you know, one of the things uh, that I found fascinating, like, like Dave, I learned a lot about Galileo when I was a student and not all of them uh, true, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of apocryphal uh, things, uh, sayings attributed to him. Um, but one of the things I, I did learn was that Galileo not only pointed his microscope up, but at, at one point he pointed it down and, and, uh, and uh, you know, used it like a, a, a microscope. Um, and you know that was the bounds of his curiosity were were unlimited, um, and uh, you know the sense of having time, you know, being confined by the plague, but also not having time because you know mortality runs out, and and that that pressure to to do stuff, create, be alive while you can be alive, because mm -hmm. uh, at some point you you won't be alive only so much time to discover things. Um, Deva, why did you decide uh, that you, we needed to read about Galileo's daughter? Um, was it just something personal to you? Was it, was there a reason? I mean, it's not like there aren't a lot of books about Galileo that have been written over the centuries. Exactly. Uh, there, there are many, many books about Galileo, but I thought I had something really new to say about him because most books don't talk about his family uh, or his daughter uh, or the fact that he really was Catholic. And when I discovered the daughter and the fact that she was a cloistered nun, I was shocked because the one thing I remembered from grade school was that Galileo was the enemy of the Catholic Church. And here was this person with two daughters who were nuns. So that was really interesting. And then the thought of their plight, these, these young women in the church married to Christ and their father on trial for heresy. It, it was, um, it was rich and, and fascinating. Mm -hmm. And the way I first encountered her was through a letter she had written uh, about the clock in her convent, which was broken. And I was trying to picture this young woman trying to fix this clock and having that father to write home to, uh, to help her. And, um, so there was the, uh, gee, everything they taught me about Galileo was wrong. And there's this fascinating person who's close to him and shows a side of his life that people aren't considering. I am, I am not Catholic, but the, um, the plight, the situation completely drew me in immediately. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought if there's any way to find out about her, that's, that's a story worth telling. And just taking that a bit further, um, so that letter, was it in English or, or you translated it? Yes, the, the letter was in a book about Galileo's work on timekeeping and longitude, something I read while doing research for longitude. Mm -hmm. So it was a scholarly treatise by an Italian American uh, scholar named Silvio Bedini. And he included this letter in the book because it related to timekeeping. And he being Italian could translate the letter. But one of the first things I found out was that the rest of the letters had not been translated. Uh, there, there were more than a hundred, but they were not translated. They'd been published with Galileo's complete works for more than a century, but it seemed that nobody had completed a translation of them. And I um, had studied Italian in college for believe me, no good reason at the time. <laughs> and the thought that I had that and I could maybe accomplish that 
just just seemed to make sense of my life. Really. So, Paul, in terms of making sense of of uh, of your life, in a way, this this book has been around in the in progress for quite a long time. Um, Paul and I have known each other for quite a few years, David. So, mm -hmm. you want to talk about um, what? Why did you finally feel you had to get it done? <laughs> what was um that's a big that's a big a big question and uh you know i i grew up in uh it, my brother and i had a really interesting upbringing you know my my father was born in the in the early 30s in saskatchewan to uh to an unwed teenage swedish immigrant um and so he was from the age of 13 shipped around to all his relatives as as farm labor and paid in in cigarettes and and beer um, so growing up, you know, uh, a named capital B bastard and uh, and uh, an alcoholic from uh, from a very early age, um, tough upbringing. But but mm -hmm. in the midst of that, he he actually became very very literate and and was an amateur astronomer, um, had a, had a mm -hmm. telescope and and uh, you know was was uh, very um, very science science focused, especially space focused. Uh, you know, my mother, on the other hand, was was uh, was Sicilian. Um, her grandmother, uh, her grandmother's last name was Cicero, and, and they traced their line all the way back to the original Cicero. Um, she was born in the mid '30s in in Hamilton, Ontario, and likewise was pulled out of school when she was 13 when her mother died, um, and she was pulled out to basically raise her little brother. Right, um, that's that's what what her role was, growing up in. Um, really strict Catholic upbringing, uh, also with with quite severe epilepsy and undiagnosed uh, um, uh, other mental stuff going on. And yet she was also extremely literate and, and well read. And, uh, you know, she loved loved history. So we grew up around books for as long as my parents were, were together. And, and that's that's sort of the the parenting tools I was I was given or, or had to, to rely on. Then, of course, um, when you grow up in, in that sort of extreme poverty, uh, you know, one step away from, from being homeless in poverty, uh, the big questions in your life are, are how. How are you going to get food? How are you going to keep a roof over your head? Um, how are you going to, to make your way in, in the world? Um, and then you have children, and suddenly the question that is much more important is, is why um you know why are you doing this uh, for whom are you bearing witness who is going to bear witness for for you and really that's the difference i think between science and and religion that's why there's no conflict between those two right science is primarily concerned with the how and religion and spirituality and all of those other things are are, are primarily concerned with the with the question of of why and so you know when we had children and then my mother passed away early um when my daughter was 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 very young and then the kids started to get old and then we ran into this issue we got involved with the anglican church in our neighborhood who had a big parcel of land and wanted to to do um some subsidized housing um some social housing and uh the neighborhood we lived in just lost its collective mind. I had never experienced NIMBY before. Some genius even spray painted on the side of the church, no homeless, um, if, if, you can, if you can believe that. So people in my neighborhood who I'd been arguing with about uh, climate change, um, you know, science deniers that way were at the same time arguing against religion or any sort of anything that, that impacted their, their property values. So, you know, it just really uh, struck home then, you know, that, that I have a voice um, and I have one thing that I seem to not be too terrible at. So, uh, you know, it's enough uh, time to stop uh, messing about and to, and to just get stuck in and finished, uh, which, is, which what I, is what I eventually did. And, and that brings us to today. So, my God, that was a long answer. I'm sorry for boring you. <laughs> It's a very fascinating one. Our whole lives go into writing our books, don't they? Yes, for sure. Um, I have a question sort of for both of you. And, and it kind of picks up in a way with, from what 
Paul, you were saying about the um, the relationship between science and religion. Um, science, we're, we're in a time where science has a very ambivalent status. There's, you know, everything from anti-vaxxers, anti, and there's a real strong anti-science feeling. Uh, and then this incredible outpouring of technological advancement and discovery. Um, do you, do you, is your work really in a way responding to that environment? Deva, do you? Uh, no? I certainly live in that environment. I don't know that my work sways people's opinion one way or the other. It's really hard to understand some of these positions, especially the climate change denial or climate catastrophe denial, uh, which I find terrifying. And picking up what Paul said about having a voice, I feel now every time I, I have a microphone, I wanna say, this is real. This, there's, no, there's no time to pretend that the evidence is not in because it is. Um, but it's hard to know how one has an impact on the rest of the world. I think I, think I just live my life. I, I see myself as a storyteller. I find stories to tell that are about science because that's what interests me. Uh, and they're about people because science is a creative people process. And I, I hope that they, they have an effect. I mean, this meeting today, um, certainly I never expected that somebody would use my book as, as a, a launch pad for writing a book of poetry. How wonderful. Um, you never know what will happen when you put a book out in the world. So, so I'm, I'm hopeful, ever hopeful. Ever hope. Paul, how hopeful are you? <laughs> and how ambivalent are you about the science versus the religion? You know, um, when you're in public, it, it becomes tiring and, and disheartening really quickly. Um, the the sort of state of of the world and and the the discourse that that you see primarily in, in social media um, and so you know I quite often all the time come back to to my family and, and the thought that that you know it really is too late for my generation um, and I don't know if this is growing up in the seventies and eighties as as Gen X but it's it's too late for us to to fix things. Uh, the most important thing I think that that I can do is is put um, my children into the world and to ensure that that they have the tools that they are going to need to not only survive but to to fix what uh, what um, is 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 broken. Uh, and that's you know back to the to the heart of, of poetry and, and finishing the book and writing this as a clear statement that's something for for my children. This is this is what I believe. Um, this these are the tools that I've been given, and 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 I'm passing them on to you. So it's a uh, hell of a responsibility, isn't it? <laughs> I tell you. And do they appreciate it? No. It's like, come on, Dad, give me the Wi-Fi password. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm absolutely teasing. Well, let's go back to the the book itself, and and uh, one of the things that fascinates me about about it is how how intensive a dialogue it is. So, Dava, you or Deva, you you chose uh, titles uh, or fragments from the letters to become the chapter titles in your book, and then Paul uses those chapter titles and 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 puts them into as as the titles of your poems. So. I'd like to go back to this idea. You were you were translating, Deva, the the letters. How did how did you come to choose certain phrases? And what were were you translating uh, uh, Marie Celeste's voice consciously? Were you trying to 
approximate the diction of, of what she would have said or how she would have said things. Yes, I mean, I, I had the evidence of what she said. And the first thing I did was to just copy over all the letters to write them out in longhand in Italian mm -hmm. to just see what that would feel like to write those words. And her prose style is unusual. She, she writes very long sentences. And I think a part of that is the time when she lived. And part of it is her uh, intelligence and she was well read and had probably learned something about writing from her father who in Italy is read as a prose stylist, um, not just a scientist. Scientists used to be able to write really well. Uh, most of them don't anymore <laughs> because they have to write for journal publication and that just squashes any creative writing ability they might have had. <laughs> A few of them escape, but most of them don't. Um, so she had this, she, she's, she's living in poverty and she has heavy responsibilities. So she has no paper, no time. She's writing all of this in stolen moments and yet it's gorgeous. So I very much wanted to preserve that. Interestingly, I mean, these letters hung around untranslated for 400 years. And at the same time I was working, a professor of Italian at one of the New York universities was also translating her letters. And uh, she showed me her work and she had taken a different approach where she saw Maria Celeste as somebody who was ahead of her time. And so she broke up all those very long sentences into short ones to give this sense of modernity. Mm -hmm. And I thought she had just cut the heart out of the whole thing. I mean, it was just, um, because her language is musical and she has an ability to be talking about something very mundane, the laundry, the cooking. And in the next breath, she is in paradise. And one of the um, major supports I had in the whole process of writing this book was finding a modern day convent of the poor Clares. And I, I kept up a correspondence with the mother abbess throughout this project. Uh, she was in America. She was the uh, mother abbess of poor Claire's in America. And they had no idea that Galileo's daughters had been part of their religious order. They were really tickled to discover that. And they were so helpful. And we communicated completely by letter. This was, I don't think they had email and, and I was pretty, new to it, this would have been the late 90s. And so everything was a letter back and forth. And this nun's letters were very much like Maria Celeste in the way she could make that leap. It was like they all went to the same correspondence school. <laughs> uh, but I, and I have saved all, we corresponded till 2006 when she died. And, um, and I continue corresponding with the current abbess because this writing this book changed my life. Really? That sounds like another book in the making. I don't know. I don't find my life nearly as interesting as Galileo's. <laughs> well, <I don't> <laughs> um, so the specific uh, oh, so the, the, the phrases that I pulled out to be the chapter titles, many of them are from her letters, but quite a number, I've, I've not made a count, but quite a number are from Galileo's writings. 
So uh, in the very face of the sun, I'm pretty sure is his. And um, uh, how the Lord chastises us with these whips is hers. Um, uh-huh. they, so- it, it helps them. It's their story. And so it, it helps them have continue to have their dialogue because his letters disappeared. So everything that's quoted from him is from one of his books or a letter to someone else, but none of his letters to any of his children survive. That seems like such a pity. Um, yeah. That at least we have hers. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, all right, then Paul, uh, so I was trying to figure out which came first, the chapter titles or the idea for a poem? Like, did you, when you were, you, you got the idea that you were going to use this as a structural device, um, did you, you had a poem that you needed to write and then you hunted through the book to find chapters that are titles that would work or did it, did you, yeah, how did you do that? Well, I'm going to make a confession. Every single poem I've ever written has started with the with the title. Um, I am a child of my generation, I, I guess, uh, a magpie for for shiny things, uh, for images or emotions, um, and and I really do. Um, you know, the title of a poem I try to do it in in my work is 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 the heart of the poem it, it really is is the, the sort of key poetic element um and so i started with with the titles and then you know reading the the chapters some of the poems uh sort of pick up on some of the themes in in those in those chapters some don't um some poems just be came what they were um just taking off uh, off from the from the title um, you know, I don't approach poetry with writing with something to say. Um, I try to make people feel things, um, emotions with the, with the fewest, the fewest words possible. And, uh, and, uh, you know, a book of, of, of just poetry titles would be the, the perfect book of poetry, I think. <laughs> well, it's going to take me a long time to write that one. <laughs> for the title. <laughs> Could I, well, could I could say something about the titles? Because uh, Paul took all of these phrases as titles of poems, but the title of his book is completely, completely different. And that has always struck me. I, I wonder where did that come from, Paul, if I may ask you? Oh my goodness! Uh, you're laying bare all of all of my secrets. Um, well, you don't lun- have to answer. <laughs> the, the, the phrase "lunatic engine" uh, was uh, was an early email address of mine, just because of those two words, sonically and the image, uh, were just were just perfect. And and so um, I actually the before I realized I, I had a book, I think it was halfway through writing the poems before I realized, you know, what was, was happening with, uh, with the book and uh, trying to find a, a title. And it was, it was my, my pal, the poet Andy Weaver, who's like, dude, use your email address. Like that's exactly what the book should be called. And I'm like, holy cow, you're absolutely right. So there you go. Okay. Well, I, the title Galileo's Daughter came to me immediately with the thought that that a book about her was what I wanted to write more than anything. And um, I mean, what else could you call it? it? It just always seemed so perfectly right. But there was a period when the, the publisher really wanted me to change it because they were afraid that it sounded like a chick book And, um, but I, they couldn't come up with anything better. So I, I won my title. And I mean, if you feel you've been the focus of too much personal uh, questioning, I will say my, my father was a, um, a medical doctor. And uh, because he had delivered every baby in the neighborhood, everybody knew him. So, uh, the rest of the family, we were just extensions of him. 
and and I grow up just being Dr. Sobel's daughter. And there's something about the cadence of Galileo's daughter. I mean, it's this, it's exactly the same. Yeah. And so, um, uh, and there were things about my relationship with my father that uh, drew me to this story that I didn't even realize until I was well into it that, um, and my father died before I began this project. But then I remembered that when he died and I was helping my mother go through his belongings and I was looking for some little thing I could just have as a keepsake. And in his top dresser drawer, there was a letter from me that, that I had written him, I don't know, 20 years previously. So the, the concept of a, of a father who saved his daughter's letters, it, 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 it got me even before I understood why it got to me. Isn't that a great story? Um, okay, I am actually gonna skip here then from my list of questions. I'm going to ask you to read, Paul, um, the, the third poem, Letters on Sunspots. Um, here we go. Letters on sunspots, and it has two epigraphs. And for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon. Deuteronomy 33, 14. And then, I ask you to give him this piece of news from me, that I have most conclusive arguments ready, showing clearly that, just as he holds, all the planets receive their light from the sun being by constitution bodies dark and devoid of light. It's of course, Galileo. And as we sit in April and wait for the days to grow longer, we think of other things we can measure. The height of the tiny seeds just sprouted in the tiny pots lined up on the kitchen sill. The number of times your thumb has played middle C this past week while learning the national anthem so you can play it in front of the whole school at the year-end concert in June. The length of time it takes for the sun to travel from one end of the cat to the other. The approximate distance our afternoon snack of bananas traveled by hand, by donkey, by truck, by ship, by truck again, by our car, and at last by hand again to our mouths. The ratio between your six years and your 42 inches of height and your 30 centimeters of hair and your five missing teeth. And you say there aren't numbers large enough to measure how much you love me. I am undone by you, daughter, and your terrible host of hugs and kisses. Though even the sun is blemished in this season, in this moment, you are perfect, my dove my undefiled one. Beautiful poem. So beautiful. And it's, um, I, I'd like to just talk again about how family has been such a driver in a way for, for your book, Paul, and also unexpectedly, Deva, for yours. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that you normally think of in connection with a science book or always in connection with a, um, a book of poetry. But um, maybe I'm just trying to think what the parallels are between you as a father and your father as a father. Um, what, what, what resonances are there? What? Um, that is a really good question, and you know, I, a lot of the book is is trying to to pick that up um, a, a, a bit. Um, the one thing about my father was. 
um, when he was not drinking um, in his sober moments um, during during the week, he was very taciturn, very very um, didn't speak, very very strict. And when he was drinking, though, he was very emotional um, and and demonstrative and and open. And we would have great conversations um, about things. And um, that emotional openness and and honesty um, is something that I I think really early on in 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 you know my 20s um, when life started getting serious was, was something I, 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 I valued and try to approach life the same way though without having to to you know lubricate um, with uh, with alcohol b- beforehand so so you know taking those lessons from from the past and taking what was was good and trying to to multiply and, and amplify and and carry that on and put that forward um yeah and and deva about you how are you a daughter like marie celeste sue or marie celeste in in feeling love and gratitude and relying on my father for lots of help over a long period of time. That was one of the things from her letters that really struck me that whatever she asked for, a few letters later, she'd be thanking him for whatever it was. So there was a a constant flow of doing things for one another Mm -hmm. that I, that I hope I emulated and uh, uh, certainly feel with my own children. Mm -hmm. Obviously I'm not a father, but um, for any parent, just the relationship you hope to establish that, uh, that, that prepares them to, to leave you and yet have a, uh, an ongoing relationship of some kind. Mm -hmm. And so now now that I'm guessing my children are just a little bit younger than Paul. Um, So they're both off living their lives, which is great. Um, But we we really like each other (laughs) and we, you know, we, we really enjoy talking, getting together. Uh, and they've, they've become different people. They're not, you know, they're not like me. And, uh, and that's fine. That's any parent's aspiration, I think. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm going to say it's interesting how books that are about science in a way also become books about family and you know I think that might be a place to leave our conversation for now um is there anything else you'd like to to oh I know I do have one more thing to say and it's another connection David you you actually mentioned at the beginning, it was kind of cool to find yourself the inspiration for a book of poetry. Um, you do have a, an interest in poetry. I do. And, and specifically in science poetry, which I uh, was surprised to discover in the 1970s. Uh, I was working at Cornell then as science writer in the News Bureau. And I met Diane Ackerman, who is a, an author and poet. And at the time she was working toward a graduate degree in English, writing a cycle of poems about the planets. And she had 
convinced, although I don't think he took very much convincing, she'd asked Carl Sagan to be on her committee and to allow her to spend an hour a day with him so that she could learn the latest information about planetary, planetary exploration. And he loved that idea. Sagan was an excellent writer. I said earlier that many scientists have it beaten out of them, but he was really a, a, a wonderful writer. And so when I met her, I uh, loved the idea of, of poetry about science and have more or less collected it ever since. She, um, she and I thought of doing an, an anthology at one time of poetry about science. It almost happened. But then uh, about a year ago, just before, uh, a few months before Scientific American's 175th anniversary, I learned that the earliest issue of the magazine, the earliest several issues had included poetry. And all of those back issues are online. So I went to the sure, there were two poems in the first issue of Scientific American. So I thought, what about bringing it back? And I just wrote to the editors and suggested it. And they were remarkably enthusiastic. <laughs> And um, uh, in no time, I found myself the poetry editor at Scientific American, which I've been doing now for about a year. Mm -hmm. And this is just some of the most fun I've ever had. Uh, and, and Diane contributed the first poem to this uh, column, which is called Neater. Uh -huh. You may get swamped. No. Well, I was hoping at the outset to get swamped and it had a very slow start, but people are noticing. And uh, so I, I do get submissions now. And um, it's interesting, many people will write a poem with an idea from a scientific term. But then the poem will be just about what that term means to them. And yet there are poems that really are about science mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they're not the same thing. So, so I write a lot of rejection letters. <laughs> Doesn't every I, poem. I, I take, I, I try to take, having received so many myself, I, 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 I take a lot of pains writing them gently. So, Paul, you're, you're, um, shall we have just one last poem from you uh, that perhaps has science and poetry together? I, uh, yes. Um, yes, I have some new poems, David, that I may, I may send your way, so. Send them on. So there you go. Um, let's, uh, uh, keeping with the theme of our conversation, let's, let's read with How Our Father is Favored. By the beating wings of wasps, we must patiently. By the split syrinx of songbirds, we must submit. By the friction of water on stone, we must ourselves. By the striking and scraping of chitin, we must will. By this experience, we know but a few methods for making sounds. By this endless fractal expansion of knowledge, we must patiently submit ourselves to the will. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lovely place to end. Thank you both so much. For this thank you, Alice, and thank you, David. It's, a, it's been such a pleasure. Thanks to both of you.